All right, thank you everybody for uh, joining us today. And we're going to talk about Bracken Cave and all the other things we have going on besides the, the cave itself and the bats. So just to get, get everybody together on the same page, uh, they, it shows you where we are here in uh, Central Texas. But Bracken Cave is 1,500 acre preserve just outside of San Antonio, Texas, kind of right in the hill, Texas hill country. Um, it's real important habitat. Uh, it's part of the recharge zone for the um, Edwards Aquifer, and it's a karst uh, landscape. We so said we have a lot of steep, stony hills, uh, open uh, juniper, oak, woodland mix with uh, patches of grassland here and there. So this image is here shows you uh, Civilo Creek, which borders the preserve, and it's real important for three different re primary reasons. One. Uh, we're protecting the aquifer here in San Antonio. It's where we get all our drinking water. So the water, rainfall that lands on the preserve ends up down in our aquifer coming out of our, our taps. It's also there on the left, you see the golden cheek warbler. It's a migratory songbird, migrates from Central America to the Texas Hill Country. They come in mid-March, so they've been here a couple weeks. And this is where they have their babies. And then they turn around in June and migrate back to Central America. And it's also important because it's Bracken Cave, which is the home to the largest colony of bats in the world. So <clears throat> uh, in 1992, uh, Bat Conservation International started protecting land in this part of the Texas Hill Country. We border Bear County and Comal County here in Texas. And this map shows you all the different conservation lands that are now being protected um, over 5,000 acres, and it all started with that little spot where the bat is, five acres in 1992, with uh, when Bat Conservation International bought Bracken Cave. So that's, we got it all started here, protecting this land in this area. So the outline here shows you the 1,500 acre preserve that's uh, here in San Antonio, San Antonio. And we're uh, right in the middle of an urban area. You can see we actually surround a neighborhood there at the Seven Hills Ranch. And it's one of the fastest growing areas in the Texas Hill Country. So of course we have Bracken Cave. So the top right picture shows you the cave and the sinkhole. The mouth of the cave is at the bottom of a 80 foot deep sinkhole. And there in the top left shows you a picture of the, one of the front rooms in the cave and that uh, <clears throat> image on the bottom is the LIDAR scan of the surface and interior of the cave. So it kind of gives you an idea of the cave itself, which is 650 feet long, 124 feet wide, and 117 feet floor to ceiling. And that's where our 20 million bats call home. So <clears throat> and this shows you the kind of the walls in the cave. They're, you know, our bats are over 500 bats per square foot. There in the top left, here's one lone... Uh, Mexican free tail bat there on the right, really cute bats. We love them here and the showing our bat flight. So if you go to our website, uh, batcon.org, you can watch videos of uh, the bats coming out of Bracken Cave. So we really encourage everybody to do that. So. All right. And um, so moving on past the bats, uh, one of the other projects that we do on the preserve are our legacy tree survey. Uh, project. So this project is basically a way for us to kind of inventory our old growth trees. Um, so that image in the middle, that's a live oak. There's nothing for scale, so I don't know how uh, well you can tell how big it is, but um, that's, I think, our the oldest tree that we found. It's over 300 years old. Um, but we, with these surveys, we, uh, with the help of our volunteers, walk designated areas on the preserve and we're looking for trees of a certain size. Um, so each species of tree, which are mainly live oak, cedar, elm, and ash juniper, each species has its own um, trunk circumference that qualifies it as a legacy tree. So we walk around and when we find a tree that qualifies, we put a tag on it, like you can see in the bottom right corner there. Um, and then we take a bunch of measurements that goes into an app called Survey123. So we kind of have this database um, of the old growth trees um, to kind of track over time. 
Another thing that we do here in the preserve uh, that we're doing right now are our golden cheeked warbler surveys. Um, so these surveys are, uh, or these birds were listed as federally endangered since 1991. Um, and the primary reason is habitat loss and warming temperature. Um, so they're especially vulnerable to forest edge uh, habitat, which is increasing with urban development in general. So they really need large patches of really good habitat in order to successfully reproduce. Um, so like Fran mentioned earlier, they live or they winter in Central America, and then they come up here to the hill country area to breed and raise their young. Um, and they really like to use the loose bark off of ash juniper trees to build their nests. Um, they also feed um, from the insects that are around um, our ash juniper, our oak trees, and our cedar elm trees. So all of those trees that we have are really important for these birds, and we are an official um, important bird area for this species. So the surveys that we're doing right now are uh, following the, um, the IBA, the important bird area protocols. Another thing that we do on the preserve is we have regular bio blitzes. So a bio blitz is just a biological inventory. Um, so we use an app called iNaturalist, which if you're not already familiar with is a great app. It's free, anyone can get it on your smartphone or iPad or tablet. Um, the app helps you identify um, whatever you're taking a picture of. Um, and it keeps the location as well. So we have volunteers and sometimes staff who come out and basically just walk around and record everything they see. So everything from plants, animals, fungi, any living organism um, will be counted. And it kind of, for us, is a ongoing census of the biodiversity on the preserve. Uh, these are also really fun and a good way to learn what species are around you. Another project that we have going on um, is the Black Crested Titmouse Research Project. So this is being conducted through uh, Trinity University, uh, which is in San Antonio under Dr. Troy Murphy. And these birds um, are small songbirds. They live in Southern Oklahoma, uh, a couple places throughout Texas and uh, northeastern Mexico. And they really like to live in cavities, but they will also live in man-made nest boxes like you see here. So Trinity University has put up 98 nest boxes on the preserve. Uh, some of those on are on our neighboring TNC property as well. And we monitor these um, throughout the breeding season, which is uh, now, and they will have uh, sometimes two or even three nests throughout the season. So we go around, um, record if a nest is present, if there are eggs, how many eggs, um, how many nestlings, what stage of development the nestlings are in. And the researchers will also band the nestlings uh, when they're old enough. And this is a way to keep uh, track of their movements and their behavior after they've left their nest box. Sometimes they will also take blood from the birds. This does not hurt the birds at all, but it allows them to get uh, a lot of good genetic information. And with all that information, um, they're able to learn about fledging behavior, social group composition, communication signals, among other things, all of which are not very well known in this species. So some of the management activities that we have on the preserve um, we use fire as a, a very important tool. So we have uh, grasslands interdispersed amongst these juniper oak woodlands. Uh, so we'll burn a few hundred acres every three to five years, depending on the weather and, and drought conditions. Um, <clears throat> so this is an example of one of the burns that we, we did uh, back in 2019. So we've got some burns scheduled here and coming up in 2025. We also put in a lot of brush dams in some of areas. So on the left here, you can see where we've put in a brush dam of areas where we've thinned out the cedar or juniper trees. Um, just for clarification, um, Texans call ash juniper cedar. 
So it's not a real cedar tree, it's a juniper tree. But just so uh, if you're not from Texas, you'll hear us talking about cedar trees and they're really ash juniper trees. <clears throat> so we thin, uh, we thin out areas and use the brush from that to create dam these brush dams along these areas. It helps control erosion and runoff into our, into our creeks in the area. Um, some of the other tools and resources that we use, <clears throat> we do a lot of uh, GIS work using drones and LIDAR scan. This, and so that big image you see on the right-hand side is a LIDAR scan of the preserve. And all those little blue dots that you see are potential karst features. These are feature uh, depressions in the ground that are about a meter deep or more. Um, and so we use that data to go out and ground truth um, that information. So you can see on the left-hand side is one of those data points. It's, it's an actual cave that we found. And these are important because this whole area is part of our recharge zone. And we need to know where these features are um, on the preserve because this is where our, the water, our drinking water is coming from and how it's getting into the aquifer. Also, some of this uh, is also habitat for some of our uh, bats. Um, these are smaller caves that could potentially have bats or other invertebrates in the cave. So we'll do inventories on them and explore them as well. So one of the bottom pictures is one of our uh, drones that we have as part of our uh, projects that we use. Um, our sub subterranean group uses drones to help map areas of um, that we're working on for when we're doing uh, pond restoration projects, uh, identifying abandoned mines and other projects that we have that, that are going on in other parts of the world. We use drones to help with, with some of that mapping and identifying that area. So it's one of those really cool things that with some of the new technology that we have out there that we're able to take advantage of and help uh, complete our missions. <clears throat> uh, another group thing we do is uh, using recessivity and ground penetrating radar to identify some of the features. One of the things you're here is talking about, one of the cool things about Bracken Cave is the guano has accumulated to the point where there's over 100 feet of guano inside the caves. It's accumulated over thousands of years. And we know that because we measured it and we use recessivity to measure how deep the guano is. Uh, so this that slide, the color, real colorful slide that you see is, is a recessivity scan of the cave. So the left-hand side is the back of the cave, and we're moving from the back of the cave to the right outside the cave and up, up onto the surface where, where we stand to watch the bat flights and beyond. So we use that recessivity to identify um, voids under the ground. So all those red dots that you see are air, airspace. So we can identify voids under the ground and help us map out karst features and caves that we can't find um, from the surface. Uh, so that's what the, and then the left-hand side is um, <clears throat> the uh, researchers uh, putting out the recessivity and it's just a really long cable with a metal spike in the ground every meter and it measures uh, the conductivity of the ground um, uh, throughout over a period of a couple hours. So it's a really fun project that we've done throughout the cave. Um, another uh, thing we have is uh, our biggest resource that we have are our volunteers. We have um, over 100 volunteers on our roster, and they help us with everything from juniper, uh, cedar, ash juniper clearing and thinning, uh, trail work, uh, doing water mo uh, quality monitoring in some of our ponds that we have on the preserve, uh, collecting guano samples. We're, co we're collecting guano samples uh, throughout the year to uh, uh, run the DNA on the guano samples from the bats to see what the bats are eating throughout the different seasons of the year. Uh, so, so the bats, so these volunteers are really important for all these different projects. And they also help lead our bat flight tours uh, do our uh, education programs. They also help with the bio blitzes and a lot of the other projects and hiking uh, you know, on the trails and whatnot that we have throughout the preserve. So really important for all the work that we get done. 
Yeah, and so the um, the work that we do at Bracken really does extend beyond um, Bracken K Preserve itself. Um, so we do, uh, as Brandon was saying, a lot of education and outreach, both with our staff and our volunteers. Um, and this really goes on year round. Uh, we'll participate in a lot of different events. Um, we talk to a lot of school groups um, so that kids can learn about bats and why they're so important. Um, we also take part in many different uh, tabling or booth events, um, everything from farmers markets to uh, pollinator festivals um, here in Central Texas. Uh, Earth Day is a really big deal, so we usually have multiple booths out there um, in one day. And these are really just where we're representing Bat Conservation International, um, just educating people about bats. Um, why they're important, what threats they're facing, and how people can help. Um, we also, in the Hill Country area, like to tell people where they can come see bats, um, including Bracken, but other places as well, um, just to stress the importance of making that con connection of appreciating these animals to um, have them hopefully more appreciated. We also um, help with a lot of research outside of the preserve. Um, so we do research in a lot of caves um, and a lot of bat research projects. So for example, some research looking at bat movement of certain species. Uh, we do a lot of work um, around Texas uh, with white nose syndrome. Um, so for anyone who's unfamiliar, that's a disease that uh, is caused by a fungus um, that has killed millions and millions of bats in the United States since it was introduced in 2006. Um, it is present in Texas and we have about 20 caves or so that we sample four times a year. Um, we take samples of the substrate in the caves and, um, and keep track of the bat populations so that we can have a good idea of what's going on with that. Oh, and also recently we put in these uh, live web cameras. So we partnered with explore.org to get these up. Uh, you can watch these on our website, which is batcon.org. We call it the bat channel. Um, so this is really just a way that we can bring the Bracken Cave experience to anyone in the world who has internet access. Um, so if you're not in the area, you can still watch the bats come out. Um, we have two cameras, one um, that's pictured there from inside the cave looking out and one from outside the cave kind of looking down onto the cave. The really cool thing about this is uh, we also get to see everything you see here on the screen. So a lot of these animals, um, you know, ringtail cats, raccoons, owls, deer, all of these things um, that are on the preserve. And when you're there in person, you don't even get to see a lot of these all the time, either because it's too dark or because there's too many people around. Um, so this has just been a really cool way to kind of witness all the biodiversity that happens uh, on the preserve. So we're gonna share with you a fly through of Bracken Cave. This is uh, recently done a uh, color using LIDAR scans with photo overlays. So we're going to dive into the cam into the cave here. We're fly down, flying down into the sinkhole, and basically we're going to take just like the bats do. Uh, we'll take a flight through the cave to give you all a sense of what it's kind of like to be inside the cave. Um, and uh, so here, right here at the entrance to the cave, we're coming in, and <clears throat> once we get inside the room, first room here, again we're one hundred seven going to be one hundred seventeen feet floor to ceiling. Uh, then we get these large boulders, big chunks of the ceiling of the cave that's come in. So the, it's about 124 feet wide. Now we're standing here, there's a hundred feet of guano that's accumulated over thousands of years on the floor of the cave. Another really cool thing are all the invertebrates that live in the cave. And one of the biggest ones we have is our domestic flesh-eating beetles. So the floor of the cave is alive and moving as those beetles eat the guano from the bats. And they also, if a bat falls on the floor of the cave, they'll uh, consume it as well. In the very back room of the cave, we're gonna, 
there's a man-made shaft that we're flying at, getting ready to fly up through that they dug into the cave in the early 1900s. That's it, we can look up through there. And uh, that was used as part of the mining of the guano back in the 1900s. So we're gonna pop out through it. And the building that's covering this is part of the old mining operation. Uh, and uh, there's another building there that was a bunkhouse, that one right there. Uh, where uh, soldiers used to live in back in the Civil War era to guard this cave because it was real important for guano uh, to be used in gunpowder production. So, but here's kind of a, shows you the profile of the cave and uh, from below the surface. <clears throat> so that's kind of wraps up our our talk, real tour talk. We're gonna uh, open it up now for some questions and answers. So we look forward to to all your questions. Absolutely. And we've got a lot of great questions here. Um, let's uh, get into it. Doo, doo, doo. Um, we have one attendee that asked, um, I guess, I guess so maybe a, 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 an initial question first. So with the explore.org, um, are there lights that come off those webcams um, or are there any other lights that um, shine at the mouth of um, Bracken Cave? And does that bother the bats at all? Right, so we use infrared lights um, that are on the cameras for at night, so that doesn't bother the bats. Uh, so we uh, we don't use any artificial lights during the bat flights, so that we won't bother the bats because you know bats have really good eyesight, so we don't want to don't want to bother them with with the, with the light. So in the evenings um, when it gets dark, the infrared lights will kick on, and you'll be able to see all the other critters that are in the bats. Cool. Okay. Um, Julie asks, um, how is the population of the golden cheeked warbler doing? Uh, so far, so good. We, we have about 22 nesting pairs on the 1500 acres. Um, that's been very stable uh, over. Oh, Quick question. Um, did did Fran and Christy freeze or is my oh oh we lost them. Okay. Well, um hold tight, folks. Give us one second, try to bring them on back. Man, everyone's got such great questions and I am not qualified to answer any of them, I think. So, <laughs> um, hmm. Uh-huh. Somehow or another we got we got dropped. Sorry about We're that. We're back. <laughs> Yay. 
All right. Well, maybe we'll leave the video off just in case that like was um, stressful. Yeah, we got. Yeah, we got the. Yeah. <laughs> You're no, no more video. <laughs> yes. All right. Okay. Um, did you guys finish the the question? I don't even remember the question that was being asked. I think. Yeah. yeah. The Warbler one. Yeah. yeah. If that was oh. the last one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. And then, um, so we have a, a question then from. Uh, from Julie with a follow-up question from our young viewer, Taylor. Um, is the black crested titmouse threatened or endangered? And then Taylor wanted to know, um, you know, they saw the, vi the picture of um, one of the birds being taken from the nest. Um, is it being observed? Um, uh, what, what's going on in that picture? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, so the black crested titmouse is doing very well. It's not listed at all. Um, so populations are strong. Uh, so that's good news. Um, we hope it stays that way. Uh, in that picture, um, that was a bird uh, that had just been banded. Um, so they put a little tiny band on its leg um, and they're color coded. So each bird has a different combination of colors. And so that way, when it's like wearing a bracelet, it's like the bird is wearing a bracelet um so whenever they see that bird they don't have to touch it again they can just look at it through uh, the binoculars and identify that individual bird and see where it where it goes where it nests um so in that in that picture they were just putting the bird back into its nest box after um they had banded it um the bands are also really cool because they have something called an rfd tag um so it kind of we ha they have readers on some of these nest boxes, so they can also get data that way to see where an individual bird, if they're going into this nest box or a different one. Um, so it's really, really informative to the researchers and it doesn't bother the birds at all. Awesome, okay. Um, I had a question here um, from uh, LinkedIn. Um, someone would like to know how um, they can volunteer with BCI at Bracken Cave. That's a great question. Um, there are lots of different ways. And the first step is to send me an email. So Linda, maybe you can put my email in the chat. Um, what we do with our volunteer base is um, there's an application that you fill out. It's very brief, just basic information. Um, it goes into our volunteer portal, which is called Volgistics. And from there we have, um, once you're accepted into that system, there's basically just a calendar with all of the different events that we have and you can sign up for whatever you want. Um, so you can email me for a link to that application um, or just if you have general questions, um, I'm happy to answer those as well. Sweet. We always need new volunteers, so thank you. <laughs> awesome. Okay, and then Martha wanted, um, she had a question. She asked, um, did you mention a nearby property was owned by TNC, the Nature Conservancy? Um, and can you elaborate? She has supported TNC for years. Right, so Nature Conservancy has uh, 2,000 acres of um, land that borders that conservation or nationals preserve. So between us, we have 3,500 acres that's being managed uh, jointly <clears throat> to protect the bat cave and, and it's also golden sea warbler habitat and part of the rechar zone. So it's an integral part of the 5,000 uh, continuous acres that are being in, in some form of conservation easement. Got it. Okay. Um, that's my place. Okay. Um, Hitomi asks, um, when you say 100 feet of guano, do you mean 100 feet thick, uh, like from bottom to top? <laughs> yes. So when you're standing in the, on the cave, you have 170 feet to the ceiling and you have 100 feet of guano to the actual bedrock floor of the cave. That's a lot of guano. A lot of guano. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, let's see here. Um, doo -doo -doo. um, from Julie and Jennifer, what is the status of white nose syndrome in the U.S. and has it affected um, Bracken Cave or the Bat Cave near Concan? Um, is this white nose syndrome in general more under control in terms of spreading a number of bat deaths, or is it kind of the same still? 
It's more or less the same. It, I mean, it's pretty much all over North America now. In Texas, it, we got the fungus was showed up in Texas in 2017. The disease showed up in the Hill Country in 2019, 2020. Um, it's affecting our um, hibernating bats, of course, which are the cave myotas and our tricolor bats are the two bat species that are currently being affected by um, white nose syndrome in Texas. Um, and you know, the bats are still moving it around. The bracken cave, we do have the fungus in there, but because our bats are migratory and, and, the, and the cave near Concan, which is Frio bat cave, um, both of those are Mexican freetail bats that are migratory. So the fungus is there, but it's not affecting those migratory bats. Good to know. Um, we've got a question, um, similar questions from Kat and also from a viewer on Facebook. Um, what are some good plants to attract bats to our yards? Um, and for people in the hotter areas of the U.S., um, what are some species of agave that could be planted for a bat garden? <clears throat> well, if you go to our website, you can, uh, under bat gardens, you can, and that's batcon.org, you can get sp really specific information about the, the native plants that you can plant in your backyard or your, your create your own back garden. But basically we're look you're looking at native plants that are blooming, especially some that are blooming in the evening. So you're attracting moths and those other insects that the bats will eat in the, at night. Um, so whatever natives that you have in the area. So it's kind of a good thing you, you have, you'll have uh, native birds that'll be used in your backyard and butterflies and bees that take advantage of the blooming plants during the day. And then the moths that also feed on those plants at night, the bats will eat. So if you go to our website, batcon.org, you can search in there, the bat gardens, and there's more information about how to uh, put in your own bat garden. Sweet. All right. Um, let's see. A uh, fun question from another young viewer, Teddy. Um, what is the tallest cave the two of you have ever been in? And were there stalactites? <laughs> um, so for me, the, yeah, so the, uh, yeah, our caves will have lots of beautiful formations. <clears throat> the tallest, biggest room I've ever been in is a cave in Mexico. Um, and the, um, it was about it was about 800 feet uh, from floor to ceiling to, in that particular cave. So, the, and lots of beautiful stalactites, stalagmites, and different soda straws and different formations. Um, here in Texas, uh, K without a name, Cascade Caverns, Natural Bridge Caverns, which are some commercial caves, um, have you know 150 to 200 feet. Floor to ceiling and lots of beautiful formations. I don't know, Christy. What about you? Yeah, that's probably that's the one I was thinking is one like K without a name. Um, some of the commercial ones tend to be taller because they're caves that pretty much anyone can go into if you want to take a tour, um, and they do have some really awesome formations in them. Um, but yeah, I definitely haven't been in an eight hundred foot, <laughs> but hopefully someday. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so we got some good questions here from Facebook. Do the flesh eating bugs eat flesh? Yes. So they're domestic beetles. Uh, they're the same beetles that you, your museums use to clean skeletons and whatnot. So these, uh, these beetles are um, uh, carrion type beetles that they eat the uh, meat off of bones. And they also, these particular ones in Bracken will also eat the guano. So, um, as well. So it's, uh, it, it's really cool. The floor just moves. Um, there's so many beetles on the floor of the cave. It's pretty cool. We call them the housekeepers of the cave. <sighs> nice. Um, but I, I'm sure folks have this in their mind. Do they eat living flesh? If I go in the cave and trip, <laughs> am I a goner? Uh, well, it's going to take a while to nibble on you. So if you're going to hang around that long, yeah, they don't, they're not picky. Um, they they start, they start eating stuff right away. So yes, they'll, they, they're not like vultures. 
they they uh they eat they don't wait Okay. All right. So if I've fallen and can't get up, then th that could be a bad situation. That's bad news. Yeah. Got it. That's why we typically don't let people inside Bracken Cave. One of one of multiple reasons. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, some other similar questions. Um, let me see. Where was that one? Doo, doo, doo. Oh, do, uh, Donita said um, they first came out to the cave many years ago. Um, do you uh, do we still mine the guano from the cave? Um, or, and from LinkedIn, does any of the guano from Bracken get harvested for local garden shops? We uh, we stopped harvesting the guano in 2009 because of uh, the fungus that causes white nose syndrome. Back though, those were the early days of uh, the, having the fungus in the North America. We didn't have a really good way of testing for it, so we didn't know if we had it or didn't. Uh, so in 2009, we stopped harvesting the guano out of the cave um, because the guano is used all over the U.S. as a fertilizer. So it get, and we're talking. Pulling 50, 75 tons of guano out when we're hard, when it was being harvested. So, so but no, right now we no longer mar uh, harvest the guano out of the cave. Got it. Okay. Uh, Laura's got a question. Um, with all the local karst features available to bats, what makes Bracken Cave such good habitat for them? Um, well, on our particular cave, you had, you had these two ginormous rooms, you know, lots of lots of ceiling space being 117 feet the floor to space. So you, these big cavernous rooms um, make it easy for the bats to be flying around inside the cave. Um, the all between all the bats that live in the cave and the guano that's decomposing, the temperatures in the cave are over 102, 104 degrees. Um, when the bats are roosting in there. So think of it as like a giant incubator. <clears throat> so you just get this large cavernous space that's uh, easy access uh, for the bats. Um, and most of the Frio cave, most of the most of the bat, big bat roosts have large open chambers for these big colonies of bats. Cool. Okay. Um... Hitomi's doing a double take here. They say, wait, did you say bats have really good eyesight? I thought bats primarily navigated via sonar and had poor eyesight. Is that a myth? Uh, bats being blind is a myth, and uh, different species of bats have better eyesight than others, but they also use, you know, echolocation in, the, in total darkness, but, I mean, they, uh, but they still do have good eyesight. And then we had a question here about uh, from Carol. Uh, where is the closest wind farm, and are we looking at impacts? Uh, the closest wind farm will be um, out near Brackettville, uh, which is about an hour and a half, two hours or so west of San Antonio. <clears throat> um, and then there's some down near the coast. So. I mean, wind farms are a big uh, issue with uh, with bats and birds. Uh, it's, we're, we're losing hundreds of thousands of bats a year to wind farms. Um, but uh, the closest one to Bracken is, like I said, well over 60 miles away. So it's not a direct threat. Um, but our bats are also foraging at least 60 plus miles away to, uh, to where, our, where all their crops are. So they it could be an issue uh, when they're flying that far away. Right. Um, Adrian has a question. Um, they would like more information on the tree, tree inventory. Um, like, how does that work? Um, do you get the list of trees and size qualifications um, from somewhere specific, another organization, um, anything like that? Yeah. Um... So I might have to refer to Fran as to where we get like the qualifying measurements. Um, but as far as how it works is we we use our survey one, two, three to enter data and it kind of prompts you, you know, you select what species the tree is, um, the circumference of the trunk, um, height, uh, stuff like that. Um, yeah, Fran, do you know where the like original info 
So what we, what we did is we, we kind of basically took um, for an ash juniper tree somewhere around, I think it's like 96 centimeters. 96 yeah, 96 centimeters, yeah. centimeters in circumference. So gets us somewhere over 100 years old. Oak trees um, is a little bit bigger. Um, so we just, so that's kind of our, our baseline because uh, we're looking for our 100 plus year old uh, trees. So it has to do with their growth rate. Yeah. So each species of tree has its own growth rate. So we kind of calculated basically if we want to be at least 100 years old. It needs to be this circumference, if that makes sense. Okay. Let's see. Um, and then we have a question. Um, someone is asking if the bats are at Bracken right now. Uh, yep, they started migrating back into the hill country. <clears throat> Actually, in February 9th is when they started showing up uh, this year. Uh, we do have an overwintering population of over 100,000 uh, because of the uh, warmer warmer winters that we've been having over the last decade. Um, but yes, our, our bats are slowly but surely coming back. We expect them all back uh, by early May in time for our season to start in mid-May. Yeah, the the bat flight season. So if you're not aware, um, we, uh, Bracken does have um, evening and morning bat flights where folks can come to see the bats come out. Um, and if uh, we have both member nights for um, BCI members as well as public nights. Um, and you can learn more at batcon.org slash visit Bracken. Um, uh, we're we're gearing up for um, for the season. Um, lots of folks uh, emailing, making sure they've got the Bracken access code if they're members. And uh, and yeah, let's see. Do, do, do. There's so many good questions. <laughs> And uh, Melissa's asking um, uh, kind of a follow up to uh, what you had said before. So the public's not allowed in the cave, right? Um, only outside to watch the bats leave. Are there ever any situations where the public can be in the cave? Good question. Uh, short answer is no. Um, so the only time anyone ever goes in the cave is for research purposes, which even then is not very often. Um, so in addition to the beetles, the flesh eating beetles that are in there, um, there are so many bats that there's a really, really toxic environment inside the cave. So, uh, the ammonia and CO2 levels are extremely high. Um, so if you were to walk in there on your own, you would not make it very far or for very long one or the other. Um, and so whenever someone, a researcher does go in, uh, we have to have full, um, you know, PPE, full gear on respirator, masks and everything. Um, so it's kind of a, a risky situation. So we don't let anyone from the public in the cave. That we don't want to disturb it since it is a nursery colony. These are mommy and baby bats. So we don't want to be disturbing them as well. So we don't we don't go into the cave unless we have the research project means we absolutely have to. Got it. Um, and uh, another question here, um, are we planning to offer any overnight camping events at Bracken Cave um, to view the bats exiting in the evening and then re-entering in the morning? Um, this person said they attended one of these events a few years ago and they really enjoyed it. Presently, um, since uh, we are an army of two, um, <laughs> So yeah, so uh, right now uh, we don't have any plans for for camping events, uh, but we that's why we have the uh, the new morning tours for people to come out and check them out. Got it. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, Rose is asking um, if I want to go to school and work in an up and coming area of bat study and protection. What field should I study? I think there are probably a couple of routes you could go with that. Um, I can speak to my own experience, which is uh, kind of just wildlife biology and conservation biology. Um, 
I won't say you like have to have that exact degree, but something around um, in that field. Um, you could potentially get there in like natural resources if you wanted to work in like wind energy or something specific like that. Um, but general biology, uh, wildlife conservation is probably where you want to go. And then I would add to that that get as much experience as you can while you're in school. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're in the area, you could volunteer at Bracken or something like that, wherever you are, um, try to get some hands on experience while you're in school, because that will give you a really big advantage. So yeah, minimum, you're going to need a master's. Um, yeah, if you want a permanent job, you will likely need uh, a master's. Um, you could maybe get seasonal jobs uh, with an undergraduate degree. Um, but it's a lot easier with a master's degree. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, and then we have a question uh, from a kind of touched on by a number of people. Um, will the eclipse in April affect the bats at all? And might we have a video on this? Uh, <clears throat> so we will have a, a, a live, our, our webcam live on uh, the day of the uh, eclipse. So you can tune in and watch the eclipse um, from one of our cameras, if, if you like. The um, But inside the cave, it's nice and dark and warm. And the bats probably won't even know what's going on outside because they're going to be in their sleep. You know, they've been out feeding all night long, so they're going to be in there sleeping. But we're going to be there to monitor what's going on just to see if there's any change in behavior. But it's pretty dark in the cave, and they may not even notice that the lights have gone out outside. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. All right. Uh, let me see if I can find just one more question. Um, Catherine is asking about how far do the bats fly from the cave at night? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so they can fly um, basically a 60 mile radius in one single night. So they can they can fly really long distance. They'll go out and feed. Um, they might rest somewhere for a little bit in between feeding um, and then they make the same journey back in the morning. Um, so they can fly, this species specifically can make, yeah, a very long journey each night. God. And there's actually another, one more question I thought would be good to ask. Um, when we have a very dry summer, for example, last year, um, does the number of insects decrease and therefore the food for the bats decrease? And how do the bats cope with that? Yeah, so when we have our these drought situations um, and you start seeing all the crop fields drying up out there, that doesn't uh, impact the amount of bugs there are to eat because the bats are eating their body weight and bugs every night. So that's over 150 tons of bugs just at Bracken. The, um, so what they'll do is they'll actually start emerging earlier. So if it's a normal rainy season, they may not come out till 7, 30, 8 o'clock. If it's a really bad drought and foods where there's a shortage of food, they may come out as early as 6 p.m., 6.30 p.m. Uh, so we, we, we lots of light. So they're, they'll risk predation by the hawks and the owls uh, to, to get enough food to eat. Got it. Okay. Well, there were so many other good questions, folks, but unfortunately we've run out of time. Um, but maybe uh, someday we'll have a, uh, Fran and Christy back again um, and we can finish up those other questions. Um, so thank you again, um, Fran and Christy, for sharing some of the lesser known projects at Bracken and uh, letting us in on some of the hidden gems of the area. Um, thanks as well to the audience for joining us. Um, to learn more about BCI's work, um, visit our website at batcon.org. Um, if you wanna learn more about visiting Bracken um, and seeing one of the bat flights, you can go to batcon.org slash visit Bracken. Um, and if you haven't already, um, subscribe to our mailing list and newsletter. Um, that's where you'll hear all about our future webinars and um, the work that we do. Um, so this webinar recording, it will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search at Bat Conservation on YouTube. Uh, Fran and Christy, any final words for us? Just thank you for having us. Um, appreciate um, everyone coming and for all the great questions. Yeah, we look forward to seeing you guys at the Bat Cave. Absolutely. All right. So that's all for now, folks. Um, I hope everybody loves bats more than they did an hour ago. And we'll see you at the next bat chat.